I think I'll begin um, the presentation at this point. Um, people are, a few more people are filing in, but we have a relatively robust um, webinar audience already in. Um, thank you for joining us. Uh, my name's uh, John McDonald. I am a product manager for analytics at um, EBSCO Information Services. And uh, I'm happy to have you all join us uh, so we can talk about a um, project that we're working on that um, really is focused on vendor librarian partnerships to advance the uh, science and art of analytics. Uh, with me today, I have Michael Levine Clark, the Dean of Libraries at the University of Denver, and Andrew White, the Library Director at Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute. Uh, so data is kind of like this big, the data we have in libraries right now is kind of like this big pile of cars, you know, every single time you need some bit of data or um, have to produce a report, you got to go looking in this junkyard of Excel spreadsheets that, that you have um, sometimes on your laptop, sometimes on a shared drive, but you know, it's incredibly hard to find that data. Um, kind of like it would be really hard to go find a part um, uh, for your car in that junkyard. So we know um, libraries have um, too much data. There's big data everywhere. You've got various different data silos, maybe some warehouses, maybe there's a, a campus initiative to try to get your data under control. Um, but really, how do you um, take that as a library? How do you take all these different data sources, wrangle them into um, a form in which you can actually work with them and that you can analyze them and then really support your decision making? So. Um, at EBSCO, our um, vision was to partner with libraries on a tool that is vendor agnostic um, and that uses the library's own data, pulls it into an, uh, a platform where you can merge different data sets, you can unsilo your data um, and um, connect different data sources together um, so that you can um, start to really spend your time analyzing data rather than spending your time um, on the, regu the manual and rote processes of harvesting data and managing data and preserving data. Uh, so this graphic is just kind of a graphical representation of the complexity of, of information sources, information systems that we have in libraries. Um, so all the way from your ILS LMS, all the way across to um, things like your institutional repository statistics, and then down into um, the lower right hand corner, some areas where you might have um, uh, data about user engagement with the library that's controlled by another campus entity. So really the goal with um, this project is to build a platform that can harvest data across all of these different vendors out of all of these different information systems and put them together in a common interface that can really show the power of data for operational decision making. Uh, so our, our partnership um, has been um, in um, the alpha phase for about the past six months. We've now moved into our beta phase. Um, both Michael and Andrew and their institutions work with us as alpha partners to connect a number of the major data sources, build a number of default dashboards that they'll show you guys. And uh, now we're in our beta phase, continuing to work with additional libraries um, to bring more data sources into the platform and to calibrate how we actually um, are able to onboard new libraries to this platform. Our goal is to go live um, with the product in early spring and then continue to build around um, the product. Um, so we have, um, so, so it's a continually evolving and uh, flexible um, platform. So I'm gonna turn it over to Michael to talk about his experience uh, in the partnership at the University of Denver. Great, thanks, John. Um, so the, the the junkyard of, of data sources was, was I think a really perfect illustration of the problem that we, we've all experienced. Um, so we have data overload. Uh, we have um, multiple sources of data. We have frequent calls to provide data about something. Um, so we end up reacting. We end up gathering data on the, on the fly. We don't find the Excel spreadsheet in that junkyard. We create a new one, right? Because because we don't remember how where it was, um, and we just need to pull it out again. Um, because we tend to be reacting, um, we don't get a chance to be proactive with our data. We get we we end up just um, gathering data. We end up 
um, providing data that is one dimensional. We can't um, use multiple sources of data that we compare with one another. Right? So the, the current situation, and this is true in, in, I would argue in probably every academic library, um, is one where we don't have a lot of control over our data and we don't have a lot of ability to use the data um, in, in ways that would help us and would help our users. So um, when, when um, John started talking to me about the idea of, of EBSCO building an a library analytics tool, I was really excited. I liked the idea of, of building a dashboard that would aggregate data that would pull in data from all of the different sources that I'm regularly gathering data um, from uh, within my own institution. Um, so data about collections, data about services, data about building usage, um, but also data about um, the partners that use our library, data about, um, about um, students, data about um, things that impact those uses and and trying to, to do things that would allow a deeper analysis, trying to um, build a system that would allow us to, to really understand what um, usage within our collections means or what um, uh, the, the usage of a particular service means. Um, trying to build connections so that we can understand that um, students with these particular um, needs um, are best served by these particular services, or that um, people tend to um, use th this particular library service and this particular campus service in conjunction with one another. Um, if we have a tool like that, it allows for us to, um, to make decisions and make, um, make very informed decisions and often make decisions that we wouldn't have seen otherwise. So it allows us to, um, to um, perhaps craft new services, perhaps change the, the direction of, of our collection development strategies based on things that we see within the data. So we wanted to build a tool that would allow us to do all that. Um, so we've, we've been working with EBSCO um, for, for for um, a year or more now on, on this project. Uh, we have a, a library point person who happens to have within one person an understanding of our operations, of our data and data sources, and of our systems. And um, that's probably not true at every institution. Um, you might need to build a team that could do that. Um, but I would recommend that you have to have that set of um, expertise and that set of understandings, right? So understanding the data without understanding the operations and the services that the data is reporting about doesn't make sense. Um, knowing what's possible within the different systems is important. Knowing as well what is um, possible and where to reach out on campus is also important. And we, again, happen to have one person who can do all that. So she coordinated with the EBSCO team. She met regularly with them. And she was also able to, to help them understand and then help us understand within the library what was possible, um, both in terms of, of um, just uh, technology and of, of um, sort of structure and systems, but also in terms of what was possible politically uh, when reaching out to different um, partners on campus. I'd say really importantly for us, we got buy-in early from the Office of Institutional Research. They were interested in this project and interested in sharing their data and also interested in facilitating um, sharing of data from other partners on campus. So um, we, this is a collaborative project. It had to be a collaborative project um, and um, we collaborated both on campus and with, with EBSCO. As I said, we had a person who coordinated this project. Um, she also coordinated a lot of our, our response to COVID. So she was stretched especially thin. We were all stretched thin. Um, I do think that there was some challenge along the way um, to, um, to um, there was some challenge along the way to, to um, 
make sure that we actually could get the data to EBSCO when they asked for it. I'm sure there were times when we didn't get the data to EBSCO when they asked for it. In fact, I know there were, um, but we also, I think, were, were dealing with unusual pressures on campus. Um, we had regular check-ins um, with the leadership team and with EBSCO. Um, so the library leadership team met with EBSCO to talk through um, what the dashboard was starting to shape up to, to look like and what sort of sources of data we might want to put in there. And then um, I think more importantly, how we might envision using this tool um, and how we might envision using specific aspects of the tool as well. Um, we had to wrangle campus partners to help share their data. Um, and certainly we were trying along the way, especially given COVID, to protect our staff time um, and make sure that they didn't have to devote too much time to this project. So I wanna take you into to, um, the dashboards as they stand now. You can see um, up in the, uh, um, in the top corner here that this is just covering um, a, a very short amount of time, right? It's just a, um, this year. Uh, you would want to adjust it for, for all sorts of reasons, right? There, there are reasons why you'd want to not look at um, 2020, which is such an unusual year, but this is really just to give an example of the, of the front page and what sorts of things you might see. So, um, we'll dig into some of the specific dashboards. So, so here's a collection budget analysis one. You can see um, in the expenditures trend, um, you can see that the, the black line in that, in that graph actually goes down below zero. We happen to know that we overspent, but if you didn't know that you were in danger of overspending, being able to really easily as a library administrator or as a head of collection development to be able to see this sort of thing um, unfolding in real time would be really valuable. Um, so uh, here's an example from the bottom of the page. You can see um, these are um, our, our funds. You can see that, that um, mathematics uh, um, is basically almost all overspent. It's also massive. Um, and it turns out that there's actually some stuff um, categorized in math that shouldn't be. And we learned that by looking at this system. Um, going down further to chemistry, you can see that we double spent chemistry. Um, and we happen to know this. I, I, I happen to know that we had a, one of those situations where you had to pay, the same, pay an invoice to the same vendor twice in the same fiscal year. Um, but if you didn't know that, um, this is the kind of thing that would, would alert you to that and make it possible to start to adjust things um, before it's too late. Um, here's a, a cost effectiveness analysis and overview. Um, and you can see at the top that there are um, different places where you can, you can adjust by year, you can adjust by purchase model or by publisher, right? You can get some pretty detailed understanding um, and, and zero in on, on cost effectiveness. There's not a lot of data in that particular one um, just because we happen to not have loaded that much over that time period. And again, this is more about understanding what's possible than understanding about what particular data are in here right now. Um, here's another, um, another um, sheet on, on circulation of physical items. I don't know what happened in April of 2020 that caused our circulation numbers to go down. Um, I'm, I'm joking, of course, but, um, but that is the sort of thing that you, if you maybe were not paying attention or lived under a rock, you might, you might notice that, that there is a, a, this dramatic change in a particular month and that you could then look at that going forward. Um, you can also see on this same slide that, that, um, that uh, we have um, lots of, um, of um, items that check out that are not books. Our number one most circulated item is a phone charger. Um, probably true at many libraries. Obviously, you could select material tape and eliminate it. More interestingly, from April on, we've watched our circulation start to, to grow. Um, and I don't have a slide of that, but we've watched um, as as we've um, we've gone from having um, no circulation for several months, as we we had closed, to having curbside checkout, and having things. I just had a bleep in my Air AirPods. Am I there? There still? Is it good? Okay. Um, 
so um, I don't know where the slides just went. Anyway, we had a recovery in, in, in circulation um, as we've gone to curbside checkout. And it's interesting to watch the patterns um, unfold um, as people have that ability. So um, one final um, slide um, is, is a patron outcomes, right? So we have, we have some data about students. And I know that, there are, that this is um, uh, sort of scary territory when you start to, to think through um, sharing data about students. This is, this is anonymized, but it allows us to, to start to connect um, library use to student success, which is something that I think is appealing both as a way of proving library value and also as a way of thinking through um, how effective our services and our collections might be. Um, turn it over to Andrew now. Thanks, Michael. Um, so uh, a number of the uh, wants and desirabilities that Michael has already gone through uh, were, were comparable for us at Rensselaer Polytech. Um, we have, uh, as Michael indicated, a large uh, set of, very, uh, of various sets of data. Um, uh, I do not have a single point person that manages this data. And in fact, what we know is that uh, the data, there's, a, there's kind of a stakeholder and a, a point person for all the different types of data we have. So for collection development, there's one person. For patron data, there's another person. For interlibrary loan, there's yet another person who's collecting this. And uh, our goal was to reduce the amount of manual analysis, but also be able to create a matrix of all these different data sets and uh, spot some of the trends, the kinds of things that Michael was 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 uh, talking about just, just before. Um, our institute, even prior to COVID uh, and the pandemic, was very interested in identifying student outcomes, uh, and particularly in the area of uh, preventing individuals from failing. So kind of an early warning system. And uh, again, in, in speaking with EBSCO and with John, um, not, it was more than just showing a return on investment of a library, but also showing the library's impact on student performance and student outcomes. Um, as an alpha partner, and uh, the timing of our start as an alpha partner happened to coincide not, not too far different than the we uh, are being sent home uh, in the middle of March. So uh, we were trying to harvest data and provide data to uh, the EBSCO development team um, in the middle of a pandemic. Uh, it also happened to coincide with our uh, ILS migration, moving from Sierra to WMS. So um, the advantage, actually, the silver lining in, in doing this all during the pandemic was that um, Innovative has uh, recognized that we're in the middle of a pandemic and is allowing us to hold on to um, our Sierra data uh, up until the end of this calendar year. So that actually gives us an opportunity to do a little bit of a comparison, although there will be an anomaly because of the pandemic, but do a little bit of a comparison between the data types that are available out of a Sierra system and the data types that are available out of an OCLC system. Um, we also, uh, over the course of, the, of working from home uh, and remote learning, we actually had staff that were furloughed. And uh, a couple of those individuals are point people for data sources. So uh, it, it did create some challenges. The last part, uh, again, following what Michael mentioned, was about uh, student data. So the patron data information, um, we worked out with our director for information security, a hashing system, so that there is an anonymization. We know who the individuals are, but EBSCO does not. Um, the benefits that we see by, by participating as an alpha partner was uh, we had an opportunity to identify some new data sources and performance metrics that actually coincided with the pandemic. Um, we have performance metrics that we keep internally for our own operations and sets of services, but um, our uh, campus administration actually asked to demonstrate outwardly some other new types of metrics that showed library value 
during a time of the pandemic when there was practically nobody on campus and all the learning and research is predominantly remote. Um, lastly, we kind of see an opportunity to do some comparisons between uh, e-resource use, particularly what kind of data can we harvest out of our uh, open URL link resolver, what kind of data is from our proxy server, and the various counter compliant or counter non-compliant data sources that uh, we receive from our various subscription and publish subscription agents and publishers. So um, what I have here are examples of data that I, I myself am manually gathering um, to demonstrate our interlibrary loan statistics during the pandemic. And you can see this was from the prior week. We're actually doing a comparison and looking at trends at a demographic level, at a format level, and at a borrowing and lending level to show comparisons between uh, 2019 and 20, uh, 2020. And what's kind of interesting about the data right now that we're gathering and just collecting in Excel spreadsheets is that you can actually see that there is a significant uh, higher degree of interlibrary loan activity that's taking place during the pandemic. Um, and, and, and the one that kind of catches my attention immediately is our lending to other libraries. You may know uh, kind of um, uh, just in, just from uh, looking at some numbers, you may just know that uh, you are either a net lender or a net borrower, um, but here it is in black and white. Now, what would be great is to be able to do this across disciplines and uh, uh, to see which are the, the, the subject areas where we're doing more net lending and more let, uh, net borrowing. Uh, so this is an example of what we have uh, in the now with the EBSCO tool. Uh, this is looking at our journal use. Um, and one of the things that we took advantage of was uh, gathering some of our counter stats with uh, EBSCO's usage consolidation tool. Um, so that actually provides us with a lot of uh, additional level of details, which you can kind of see uh, in the bottom right hand corner. Um, it's kind of a bubble heat map. Um, and if we look at the next slide, um, you can see this is uh, the ability to, to drill down within a particular package. This is an ebook package. And we could see a uh, volume of use of given titles within a particular ebook package. Uh, I, I think this is pretty interesting. Um, we're a research institution, and I think for all research institutions, you're finally uh, beginning to see that uh, research is kind of interdisciplinary and multidisciplinary. So uh, along the lines of what Michael indicated earlier, you might have categorized something under a particular subject area for collection development purposes, but when you begin to look at the use statistics across the institution, you realize that it isn't quite as uh, um, siloed as one might think. Um, you know, we're an engineering school. Chemistry is used in biochemistry, is used in chemistry, is used in material science, etc. So uh, being able to, to drill down at, at, at detail levels and understand what's behind the numbers is really useful. So uh, thank you, Andrew. Um, I think we have um, just a couple minutes for questions if anybody has anything. Um, uh, please uh, put them in the chat um, and I'll read them back and ask our panelists. Um, let's see, uh, someone asked who the magic person with all these skills is. That was probably during um, Michael's uh, uh, part of the presentation. And I will say from working with um, his colleague, um, she is definitely um, a magic person. Um, so we owe a lot um, to the development of the product um, to her. So. I'll uh, um, hopefully we'll be sending her maybe a, a nice bottle of wine via Drizzly at some point. Uh, second question, post the slides. Um, the PDF is on the, um, the agenda. Um, so a PDF of the slides is on there. Um, so feel free to, uh, to go on there. And then also you can contact any of us if you have questions um, either about the EBSCO parts or the, um, the Denver or RPI parts. Um, how does the system compare to Alma Analytics, OCLC collection evaluation, various ERMs, or in TOTA assessment? 
Um, maybe it's the ILL data integration, uh, more robust and very local data overall, perhaps. So, a great question that comes from uh, Kate Cunningham. Um, our goal with the product is to be vendor and, and product um, agnostic. So Alma Analytics is great for people that have Alma um, and it contains information about you know, your, um, your Alma instance. And if you set up um, uh, counter harvesting, it would be in there, but it's really only available to those Alma customers. Um, so this will be much more expansive. It'll cover no matter what ILS you have or what data sources you have. Our goal is to build data pipelines to harvest that data into our platform. Um, the OCLC collection evaluation tool, again, is, is more based on WorldCat, and I'm not even sure it still exists. Um, and then in TOTA assessment, I think, has, has already been sunsetted. So, um, so one differentiating factor is all of the non-collections related um, data sources that we hope to, um, to put into here. So you can imagine things like your instruction statistics, your um, uh, building gate counts, you know, your Wi-Fi access logs, whatever it is that you want to analyze, we want to be able to harvest into the platform and provide for, for um, analysis. Um, the, there was a question, um, Amy um, asked, uh, plans for a consortial version of this tool. Um, I have talked with a number of consortia and uh, we sort of need to, to, to take baby steps first and walk before we run. And every consortia that I talked to wanted a consortial version of analytics, um, but they all are so different. Each consortia is a, a special snowflake of their own. Um, so uh, we do wanna get into that at some point when appropriate, it's just a matter of figuring out when we can sequence that in. Um, we have a question on what's the product called. Um, uh, right now, it uh, doesn't currently have a, a proper name. Um, so it's just, we refer to it as the EBSCO analytics tool. Um, our goal is to go to general release um, in uh, spring of 2021. Any more questions, feel free to uh, type them into the chat. Oh, we have pathable chat questions too. Let me see if I can go across and find those. Andrew, so I'll, I'll answer a question while you're doing that. Um, okay. So there was a question about how much time was spent adding the data into the platform. And, and, and I would say that it was really the time on our end was, was downloading and or convincing somebody on campus to give us data reports that we could then give to EBSCO to do the work of adding it to the platform, right? So from, for us, the, the work was um, around gathering data, not around um, adding it into the platform, which was which was all done by EBSCO. Uh, Leanne, uh, by chance, can you help us with the pathable chat? I, I'm over on the agenda and I don't see any chat feature for questions. Or Michael, Andrew, do you guys have any idea? I don't know how to those? do it. Um, I'm trying to figure it out too. <laughs> um, Sorry, we're supposed to be good at technology, but um, <laughs> the whole pathable thing has. Uh, I think yeah, I think I can do that. Hang on. We, are, we we have become over the the last six months or so pretty good at Zoom. Um, okay. Um, oh, I see. Can you hear me? Nettie, Nettie posted in a chat that we can get to. Can, can, can you hear me? Yep. Okay. Um, nope. Hang on. Okay. I see one did come through the Zoom chat. Um, uh, thank you, Ginger, for sending this. Our dashboard board's presenting real-time data. Um, the uh, the the dashboards are as real time as the data source um, it, uh, provides. Um, so just a quick example for Folio um, that's hosted with EBSCO, 
we have a real-time data connection as a book is checked out, it's reflected on the dashboards um, for uh, other ones that maybe are updated overnight, uh, data would refresh overnight or in the case of counter statistics, you know, those come out once a month. So that would be only once a month. Um, something like maybe your student outcomes data, that might just be once a semester or maybe even once a year, depending on what the library wants. And uh, yeah, the products available for all non-folio um, libraries, we're currently working with um, partners that use Alma, Sierra, WMS, um, Michael and, and Andrew talked about those. Um, and um, as well as um, Folio. Um, so um, we've covered, you know, those four ILSs so far. And uh, another question around identifying and aligning connections between data sets. Um, so yeah, that's a great question. You know, that's kind of a, a data science-y type of, of aspect of the pro project is taking um, a, a particular data set from a particular source and, um, mod and um, and uh, and and do, applying uh, uh, the uh, data analysis to that to determine how we can connect the different data sets to each other. Um, so, in in some examples, it might be by a um, you know a, like Andrew talked about a hashed um, user ID um, that you might be using. Um, it may be um, from a hashed IP address or or whatever it is, and and it's kind of a um, a discussion between. Us as the uh, as the um, the one building the data connections, and you as a library, what you have in your data um, to try to figure that out. Yeah, in our case, it was a conversation directly with developers and our director of information security. Um, there was another question around counter reports. Um, which counter reports? Um, so far, we've worked with um, JR one. Um, uh, the ebook e one, um, the platform report, and the database report um, so far. But as we move along, we'll start adding in, as, as libraries tell us what their use cases are, we'll start adding in other counter reports that are, are available um, and building dashboards around those as well. So I, I could foresee a um, dashboard built around JR5, um, the JR5 report that's release four's terminology or the new release five's JR4, which is usage of items by year of publication. And that would provide some really fascinating information for libraries to look at on a, on a dashboard. Uh, um, massaging the data before sending it to us. Um, we actually work with raw files. Um, so um, you don't need to massage the data. And in fact, um, as we went through this process um, for our partners, you know, sometimes they had some counter reports that they had maybe taken row, like um, taken the headers out of or rows out of or columns out of. And that actually presents more of a problem than just taking the raw files having us um, uh, analyze those and then building them into the platform according to those rules. Uh, compatibility and non-compatibility within TOTA. Um, so uh, our, our product is, um, is not um, uh, uh, product specific. Um, so if you have data in Intoda and you wanted to, um, to work with us on how to um, harvest that data out of Intoda and feed it into our platform, um, then that would just be a process of, of identifying that as a new data source and then pulling it into our platform. So we haven't worked with a customer that uses in, uh, Intoda yet. Um, our dashboards on the, the issue of counter four and car, uh, counter release four and counter release five, um, our dashboards are built around the future. So we modeled them on release five and all the new metrics they have. Um, but we've imported release four reports for the historical reports and for those providers that are still providing release four. Um, uh, EBSCO has an internal process to crosswalk the metrics. Um, so the end result is you don't get some of those rich R5 metrics yet if your reports are in R4. Um, but as time goes on and more vendors are providing R5 or converting their own reports to R5, then it'll um, it'll match up with our dashboards much better. 
John. So we're out of time. Um, thank you, um, Andrew, and thank you, Michael, and thank you all participants uh, for sticking around. Um, the um, If you go on the Pathable, the, the agenda for this session, um, the PDF of the slides should be there. Thank you very much.